Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for another Front Office Rocks uh, webinar. Um, I see everybody's coming in. I know a bunch of you guys were waiting in the waiting room, so we're so excited that you're here. Um, and, and no offense to our wonderful um, help that we have today in the topic, but I was actually surprised at the number of people who joined us. So we're going to have fun on a Monday morning talking about HIPAA and, and um, all of the things that we need to know in the front office, office managers and dentists when it comes to security for our practice. So to introduce myself, uh, my name is Laura Hatch and I am the founder and owner of Front Office Rocks. Uh, if you're not familiar with Front Office Rocks, you can definitely find more information at frontofficerocks.com. But what we are is a front office training resource for dental offices. And we focus on everything from answering the phones to how to schedule, how to get patients to show up, everything that we do in the front office. We also do these live webinars that are recorded and saved for you to go back and watch with your team or later if you can't make it or if you're here live, welcome. And some of these webinars are specific just to our clients and they're on our site when you're a member of Front Office Rocks. And some are available to anybody. And this one is actually available and will be on YouTube to be replayed at any point um, because both Steve and I, who's joining me today, feel like this is such a huge topic that doesn't get talked about enough and isn't, uh, is kind of talked about at a high level. And what we want to do today is bring it down to uh, actionable steps so that you can walk away today knowing what you need to do to do the best you can um, for HIPAA in your practice. So on that regard, I will be um, following the chats on the right. If you're here um, in the chat function, if you're here live, you can ask questions along the way and I'll be monitoring the chats. I will ask Steve as they come up if they're appropriate for the question, the slide that he's on. However, there's probably going to be a ton of questions because we know that this is a very hot topic. Um, and so Steve and I will be available afterwards. We will make sure that we um, send, you know, get in touch with you and answer any questions you have. So please know at the end, Steve will give you his contact information and we'll make sure all of your questions get answered. So on that note, I would like to introduce Steve White. Steve and I have been friends and, and uh, peers in the industry for, I've known you probably, Steve, what, four years now, five years, something like that? Um, actually, you're going to love this. It's closer to seven. Is it really? Time flies, I guess, yeah. huh? <laughs> yeah, it does. Well, Steve, um, Steve works with DDS Rescue, and in my practice, we actually had DDS Rescue. I've spent many hours with Steve talking about various topics about security in the dental office, and if you recognize his voice when he's talking, for those that are Front Office Rocks clients, he's actually been on a couple of our training videos for Front Office Rocks. So, Steve, welcome. We're, we're really excited you're here. Thank you for joining us. Do you want to Tell us a little bit about you and why we have you here today to talk to us about HIPAA um, for the dental office. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I am Steve White, and we are here to talk about HIPAA compliance made easy. And understand that a lot has been said about HIPAA. We have been brought into this for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them became the fact that we as a company starting in 13 years ago, started a dental-only IT business in San Diego County in California. A little bit about myself, I joined the company shortly after it started. Uh, it was still in its startup phase. I was brought in as one of the partners in charge of sales and marketing. This, so you understand where we are from as a company, this is a dental company that has been founded and run by dental professionals. This is the third company I have been in manufacturing, been at a general management level with, and for, um, I hesitate to say this because it makes me sound so old. This is my 42nd year in the business. So, wow. um, yeah, I know. <laughs> so a little later, I'll have my hearing aid changed and my walker will be ready and I can carry on with the day. I won't even, oh. I won't even tell you how old I was when you got into the industry then. Uh, had your parents met yet? <laughs> yes. They, yeah, I was still a child, but I was, I was not thinking about being an office manager of a dental office at that point. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But it has been, a, it's a wonderful industry and a great industry. So a little bit about DDS Rescue. We are a HIPAA compliance, data recovery and consulting company. We started in Carlsbad, right up the road from Laura's office, uh, with our technology company in dental only. We grew from there 
to a business continuity system. And we did that because of the lack of reliable backups when people's servers would break down to recover data so it wouldn't get lost. Now, what it's grown to is, is hourly backups, full monitoring, round the clock. Very important uh, with the newest threats, malware tests every hour. The backups are tested for ransomware. And then when needed, and we all are going to need it sometime, we fully recover, get everything up and running without any IT person needing to be there. We do it remotely in under a half an hour. 15 to 18 minutes is our average. That's what we developed growing out of our IT business in San Diego County. What we have morphed into because of the changes in dental and regulations and compliance is also HIPAA compliance. We've been doing a lot with data security, and we'll talk more about why that happened in a little bit. But we got to the point where a number of people who do some HIPAA compliance started talking about our IT and technology business being able to perform the types of assessments and technology reviews that are, that are actually part of being HIPAA compliant. So we grew into the HIPAA compliance and ran smack into a great deal of misunderstanding of not only what is required, what is not required, IT, how that melds into it and what things need to be looked at and set up properly so that assessments can be done and so security is increased. So our consulting business part of it has grown and become clearly more than a third of our time in business, whether it's data security, data management, or just flat out how to manage your local IT provider to make sure that you're getting covered properly. So that's a little bit about who we are. Well, let's talk a little bit about why we're here today. Bottom line, HIPAA had good intentions. It still does. When this thing was set up and these uh, rules were started back almost 20 years ago, HIPAA had good intentions for the patients in the healthcare community. And there are benefits. And I, I want to stress this. When we talk about the security assessments and the security portion, not the privacy portion, and I'll tell you the definition between the two in a couple of slides, but the security aspect that HIPAA requires has very logical basis. The core of all of that is to make your security around the data greater and prevent not only possible HIPAA concerns, but prevent expensive and costly downtime. Keep in mind that the average server failure or breach, not breach, but actually ransomware attack, which is the number one thing that is taking down dental offices today, is the malicious software called ransomware. If you haven't had it, every every single corporation and threat manager for every large corporation now says it's a matter of when you're going to get hit, not if. So planning for it is something that HIPAA has talked about. Uh, every single manufacturer of security data has talked about. So to prevent you from doing that and getting that will prevent the possibilities of four to seven days of total interruption of your network and therefore downtime, if not lots okay. of data. So I'm going to jump in Go here. And not that you've said anything too high level for us, but I just want to make sure one of my goals is I know when I talk to you about your what you know for, for a living, I get kind of like, oh my gosh, that's over my head. So I'm going to make sure along the way, I'm kind of just bringing it down to office manager, front office, team level, you know, our level. So gotcha. what, you're, what you're talking about is the server. The server is what runs our entire network. So it's the, it should have, and I think you teach all the time, we should have a dedicated server, correct? Correct. Okay. So your IT company manages all of the network. You have a dedicated server. When we're talking about HIPAA here, many of us in the front office think of HIPAA, like you said, and you're going to talk about that, privacy of a patient, you know, not saying two pieces of information together, not talking about, you know, what kind of dentistry we're doing on them in this procedure. But this, what you and I are talking about today is really about the privacy and the, and the amount of information that we have available about our patients on uh, you know, in the on the server in our network, and that ransomware is is the bad people in the world <laughs> getting into our networks to either lock down our information or steal it or whatever. The bad people out there is that. Am I right? Where we're going with this? 
That's absolutely correct. The and you are you are correct in bringing it down. The server is the heart of your network. That's where all of your data should be stored, and all of the operating systems that you run off of is stored. If you lose connection to that server, it doesn't matter what workstation you're on, you're not going to be able to work. You're not going to be able to take images. You're not going to be able to look at records. You're not going to be able to review anything, including the itinerary for the day and the schedule. So okay. it is paramount that we avoid what you and I have referred to in the past, Laura, as the blue screen problem, where yes. you walk in the day, you turn on your main, you log in, which is what you're logging into is the server that runs your network. When you log in and you get nothing but blue screen, you are yes. not able to talk to the server. The server is not able to talk to anybody else. That's, that's what's going to cause massive amounts of downtime. Yes. So and you are, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, just so everybody knows along the way. So I've worked with DDS Rescue for a super long time. We were, we've been paper, paperless for a super long time. So I understand the importance of what Steve is talking about. Now, if you're an office manager or, or here, many times I had to battle with my doctor about investing in the server, making sure we had a good IT company, um, having a good backup because when you are paperless and it's all on the computers and you walk in and you can't get to your server, there's, it could be hopefully small, but many times, and now more and more, it's getting bigger. So one small, small story I'll tell is just in San Diego, you know, we've had issues with fires in the past and Steve, you know, this, 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 um, story I have, mm -hmm. but everybody's evacuating. We had to close the office super fast. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have time to reach out to anybody. And all I knew to do was to take my DDS rescue, my backup from DDS rescue and take it with me because I thought if our office burns down, at least I have the information that we need to be back up and running somewhere else. And that's a totally different subject, but I, I believe in and, and have worked with DDS Rescue for a long time. Now, when it comes to this HIPAA and privacy stuff that we're talking about today, Steve has talked to me about this for, he just told me, seven years. And I thought, okay, but that'll <laughs> never happen to anybody I know. I actually, last Monday, somebody I know, a dentist who's very close to me that I'm friends with, this happened in their office. So I'm telling you when Steve says it will happen, it's going to happen. And I personally never have known anybody that this has happened to. And now I'm working with somebody who it's happened to. So I really, I bring that up to just have you guys pay attention to this because you think it's never going to happen to you. And when it does, you're going to remember this and wish you had invested the time and money and energy into making sure you're compliant. So that's my two cents. You're welcome. We could go now, uh, Steve. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. And, and on that vein, it's, it sounds like, you know, no one likes to be the little dark rain cloud. Uh, and I am certainly, as Laura will tell you, an optimistic individual. But simply put, this ransomware is something that everybody needs to take very, very close attention to personally and professionally. The growth rate of this crime, IBM's own report said last year, 6,000% increase in successful attacks on small businesses and 70% of their backups failed them for a multiple of reasons. And therefore, even in the HHS.gov's emails of what steps to take, the biggest thing they're saying is get an assessment, and they're, which is required. And they're also saying get a recovery system because you're going to get hit. Figure out exactly what your backup will do for you so when you get hit, you know what to expect. And there's ways to guard against it. And they're not terribly difficult. They are, however, logical. So that's what we're going to try to make sure we go through today of the steps and how to make sure that you don't end up becoming a victim to what is wildly growing as the fastest crime out there. And according to the FBI, the least or the most underreported crime this year, they're expecting it will generate six billion dollars worth of ransom. Four years ago, there was none. So anyways, there are serious fines and HIPAA breaches. However, none of them have really happened in dental as of yet. Can it happen? Sure. Are you a covered entity? Sure. Is compliance needed? Absolutely. Are there ways to get through it? Certainly. But there's ways to get through it that are easier on you and more thorough at the same time. And again, I want to make sure that we start talking about the difference between the privacy part of things and the security part, because HIPAA looks at them equal. And so let's look at what the alternatives are and how to become compliant. 
there are two things that are absolutely mandatory. You do have to have policies and procedure manuals on site. They need to be up to date. They need to include training. You need to have annual updated training. You need to have annual updated parts for both the HIPAA and very importantly, your state regulations as they vary from the federal. And by the way, uh, for example, here in the state of California, the uh, rules say if there's a breach of a single file or multiple, you must inform that person of the breach of their personal health information, uh, protected health information and their personal data, and you've got 60 days to do it. State of California says you have 30. Now, if you are audited, whoever audits you will default to which one of those two better protects the patient. So if you're just looking at the federal and not the state within where you are and how they vary, you could be opening yourself up to some disappointment. So that needs to be part of it. When you say breach, what does that mean? That is an that is an unauthorized, unintended exposure of somebody's personal information. So um, somebody's looked at somebody's gotten in and, and either paper or electronic gotten in and reviewed your personal information, date of birth, credit card information, uh, social security numbers, uh, what you've had done, what your health record is, any of that record itself, if there has been somebody unintended and not authorized, in other words, not a actual healthcare provider or member of the family, then that is considered a breach because you as covered entities need to protect that data. It is part of the law. You need to protect every one of your patients' data from uninvited, unintended exposure to people who might use it for, say, identity theft, which is the single largest reason we see for breaches, according to police, is identity theft. So that's what is covered. Is that covered for you, Laura? Yep, that's great. All right. Now, the HIPAA risk assessment is to deal with the security side of it. If you've got the privacy side covered and all your people are trained and you know the policies and you know the forms, but you also have to make sure that the security of that actual data that is protected, and that's all the electronic protected health information, EPHI, and it needs to be done on file in your office in current. Current is defined by the by HIPAA as at least once a year. And if you have any significant changes to your network, um, you add a new workstation, you change a, a computer at any station, you change um, practice management software, you make any major changes in your software, any major changes in any of the hardware, you need to have it done again so that you can make sure that it's protected. And here are the ways that we see as the options, the average cost and the time involved. The most popular is the do-it-yourself policies, either from the ADA or there's a couple of manufacturers that make them. And that's the book. You buy the book and it's a do-it-yourself. Costs between $3.95 and $6.99. Frequently, there's supplements that need to be purchased every year. Here's the kicker. That's the one that's going to take the most effort on your part and have nothing to do with the security aspect because it doesn't run anything on your network. It will have some questions, but they're only questionnaires. And I apologize if I'm going to offend anybody with the following comment, but I would be surprised if many of the people on here know the level of protection that a firewall they may have provides. And if it has an open security system and allowing it to upgrade, those are the types of questions that are needed to be answered that an assessment properly done will provide, but a questionnaire probably won't. And we have never seen anybody that's bought a do-it-yourself and it's taken less than 35 hours, man hours. Usually it's much more like 60 is the average. On-site consultants, I've put down an average of $3,000. Uh, two of the more popular ones that I actually have a lot of faith in, they're very good people. They charge about $5,000. It takes about two to four days on site. And then there's the annual updates that need to be done. Then there's the off-site third-party type, of which we would be one. The average nationally is $1,200. Low-end office time, about two hours. 
an hour a year updating. That would, it's what it would take to get it done. That takes it off of your plate and allows somebody else to manage it. Questions on that? Um, I do in the sense of, okay, most offices that um, have a server and a network and stuff have an IT company. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. the dentist that I'm, I know had is an IT company. Is that, and they say, okay, you're, you're up and running and everything's good. Everything's up to date. Does that cover what you're talking about here? Or is this something in addition that we should get done? This is totally separate. And, and it's one of the, and your question is excellent. And the fact that one, I didn't know it was coming, and two, it sounds like I'm pandering to you, but <laughs> as friends, you know I'm not. Um, most IT companies and most people you deal with will say we are HIPAA compliant. That is them referring to the fact as a business associate, everything they do, that they do in their part is compliant with HIPAA. That does not, however, mean that if they work for you, they have made you HIPAA compliant because they haven't. The, the privacy and policy procedures and manuals are all self and done by, by the office. Unless your HIPAA pro, or your IT provider says that they have a singular separate HIPAA program. There are some that attempt to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen some averages like 12 to $2,000 to do it. But you need to make sure, and the biggest thing that we have found, and I mean seriously, of all of the HIPAA assessments that we have done throughout the country, we have run into two offices that ever had a correct HIPAA assessment, and neither were current. All the other ones really didn't even know that it was needed, and that's probably the case with everyone we're talking to today. Many people thought this was something that you should have done, but it wasn't a requirement. Well, it is a requirement, and there's some very valid reasons why. It's the biggest threat today to security and the biggest reasons for any healthcare breaches and fines all revolve around the security of the data, not the privacy part. They are the biggest fines, and we'll go over that in a little bit of what's caused them. It has nothing, none of the big fines have anything to do with privacy and everything to do with security. So. Okay. So it is serious. Uh, we need to address it, and there are ways to do it. The ADA has a manual. That is the most popular one we see. And then we ask, how long did it take to get it set up? And do you do it religiously? And the answer is tails off a little bit. Well, kind of, maybe, sort of, not really. <laughs> right. And Well, but it is. It's a, it's, it's a daunting task. And whoever gets ta tagged with the security officer had some real serious responsibilities. So trying to take that off your plate is what we try to do. So let's take a quick look at what HIPAA is. I'm going to go through this quickly. Any questions you've got on it, let me know. But this is actually the five different titles to Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Title I started all the way back in 1996. Title II started preventing health fraud and abuse, administrative simplification. Three was the tax-related health part. Four is enforcement. And that is where the High Tech Act came in, where the actual teeth came in with this. Because realize, this started in 1996, but until we came up with the High Tech Act, nobody really paid a lot of attention because there were no fines. Right. And there was no vehicle for them to enforce it to say you didn't do it. That changed when the High Tech Act came out. We'll explain a little more of that. Title V is how is it going to actually be paid for? That's where manufacturers like ourselves actually get taxed a user amount to help pay for it. In other words, the assumption was under the Obamacare part of this, if you will, that <clears throat> if we as health manufacturers have more people dealing with our products, we should help pay for it with a two point, uh, I think it's 2.14 percent tax. So there is the revenue part of it to make sure that it doesn't fall onto consumers like yourself or to patients. But the part we really want to key in on is Title II, where it deals with the security and the privacy and the rules that came in in 2003. So. 2013, excuse me. Let's look at the omnibus rule, most significant part uh, that impacts the practices. 
Here's the key that one of the things we were talking about, your business associates agreements. If you aren't familiar with them and if you're not using the most up-to-date, please, either through us or whomever, get the most up-to-date. This did a very good job of stating who is responsible should you hire somebody and something bad goes wrong. Where are the responsibilities? It lays them right out legally. That's why you should always have a business associates agreement, even, even with us, if we're just going to do the assessment. Because we can touch your server, you need a BAA, and we provide that to you before we do any assessments. So I'm going to make jump, sure. I'm going to jump in here just to make sure everybody understands because I don't know. I've talked to a lot of office managers who are not familiar with this. The BAA you need to have with any company that potentially has access to your data. So um, your IT company, um, DDS Rescue, um, somebody logging in remotely to do um, outsourcing, your uh, cleaning company. Uh, anybody who's going to have access or or be able to get into your data or be near your data. Am I correct in that? That's absolutely correct. And like I flashed up on the screen here, there's some common ones. Any yeah. billing companies, oh, I'm one all step of ahead your of you softwares. <laughs> Go ahead. I said I was one step ahead of you. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. You just stay right there. You're doing great. But there's there's a long list of this, and you should always default to the fact of having a business associates agreement and have one that is written properly for healthcare. Um, we have we have gone to the extreme, and we'll explain a little, a little bit. We've gone to the extreme of having an expert who is nothing but a HIPAA attorney. That's all this woman does. And I'll explain her credentials a little bit, and they frankly, um, <laughs> they impressed they impressed the heck out of me, so we're very glad to have her on board. But that is a very important part. Now, the HIPAA breach notification rule from 2009, this is one you really need to make sure you understand because your responsibilities and how you treat this could go from a difference of a reportable event to a non-reportable event, which means do you have to tell HIPAA or don't you have to tell HIPAA? Do you have to tell the patients? Don't you have to tell the patients? To a findable situation and you don't need that. So let's pay attention to this. Uh, breach rule covers entities and businesses associates to provide notification following a breach of unsecured protected health information. Now, unsecured is an important part. There are some definitions. If you lose a laptop and it's got patient files on it, and it is protected by the definition of HIPAA, you do not have a reportable event. Protection in that case would be through encryption, and we can discuss that later of how that can be done to protect it. If, however, it is unprotected, like it's a thumb drive or a hard drive, little removable disks from the back of your, your backup disks, if you will, if one of those is lost and it is not properly encrypted, it is a reportable event to both the government and to each individual. Now, there are enforcement and fines. We have not seen any of the real fines in the dental area. We haven't seen any of those much at all yet in dental, but that doesn't mean they're not coming because boy, they are in the medical. So Health and Human Services, Civil Rights Enforcement, Breach Notification Rule to impose and collect fines. The definition of a breach, generally an impermissible use or disclosure under the privacy rule that compromises the security or privacy of the protected health information. That's it. You're protecting somebody's data. If it has been compromised, it's probably a reportable event. So what do you have to do? You may know this, you may not. It does bear repeating. The event of a breach You've got to do the following. You've got to notify every single patient involved in writing. And if the patient has passed away, they're next of kin. It has to be done according to the federal laws within 60 days of knowing that there's been a breach. So if you know that uh, you lost an item that is carrying patient information, you have 60 days after you've discovered it to notify them. Again, it must be in writing. State laws vary, as I've already said. California, it's 30 days, so you've got to act to whichever one protects the patient most. You then have to notice uh, post-description 
with HHS secretary and go to the hhs.gov website into something that's known as the wall of shame, if you will, with HHS. And it's posted. You can go to it right now and look at it. And all of those that have declared are on there. There are steps you need to take. And if you follow it correctly, you have something called an incident report. And if it's just one or two pieces of information for one or two members, less than 500, you don't have to do a full notification to the government unless it's a major breach, which constitutes 500 or more patients, which would be, of course, your server or getting access to your server or losing one of your backup disks or a computer that is portable, a laptop that has it on it. And at that point in time, and here's where the problem really becomes from a standpoint of impact on your practice. You do have to notify all the media outlets, TV, radio, newspaper with a um, press release type notification for them to announce out that if anybody has been a patient now or in the past of this dental office, your, your information may have been breached. Contact this office, please, if you have not already been contacted. So anytime somebody Googles you after this, this is the first thing they're going to see from it. At that point in time, you are going to get a follow-up from HHS.gov. They want to see why it happened. If there was a noticeable way you didn't properly follow the rules to date, that really hasn't been the case. But they want to make sure that whatever it was that caused the breach, you've corrected it. And that's not illogical. They want to know why it happened and what to do about it. Now, so gonna, are there any questions about this? Yeah. So, well, I just have one comment is the fine. I mean, we haven't been fined in our industry yet, or there hasn't been big fines, but man, I can see that being an issue of just, if you had to notify the public about this, of her, hurting your potential new patients and patients in the practice. So another motivation to make sure that you're following the rules. But um, I'm thinking right now of people who would say, okay, but what about you know, there's a password on my server. There's, um, I work with a practice management software that says the data is encrypted. So how does that cover us with regards to um, making sure we're not going to have a breach? Well, that's why you have an incident report. Okay. You self audit and you look at things like that. For example, if every bit of your images and health information was simply on your practice management that is encrypted when it is closed at a level that the government accepts, and you need to have that on record. And every practice management software out there will tell you at what level they encrypt at. Just by saying it's encrypted doesn't mean it's encrypted at a level that's protected. In fact, one of the very large practice management software companies got fined very significantly and then put on a 10-year annual audit list because they allowed, they allowed customers to believe that it was encrypted at a level that protected them. And the auditor said they should have been calling it camouflage instead of encryption. It was so low. So don't assume anything in this part because it's your responsibility as the owner of the data to make sure it's protected. Okay. You still, and so if you are using a software and Dentrex or Eaglesoft, I'll just use those. I'm not favoring one over the other, but let's just talk about those. Both of those now with their most recent versions are encrypted. So if somebody were to unplug your server and walk out with it, and you did not have any other health records, including images, be they 2D or 35 millimeter, doesn't matter. Those are considered health records. Those are considered by the ADA and HHS.gov as something that needs to be protected. If that is all confined to your practice management software, you have a defendable position. You have a position that says everything that left was under an encrypted software that is encrypted at this level. And you show the auditor what it is or put it in the file that says, I've protected it. They can't get in. It's a non-event. This is all part of what needs to be looked at and needs to be done with the training, with the uh, security officer, and with the backup of a good HIPAA attorney to answer these questions so that you don't automatically overreact or underreact. 
So, and I, I've <laughs> talked to many people um, and I don't do audits. I don't go in office. I'm not a consultant, but I know there are plenty of pr- policies or systems that dental offices use though, where a lot of that data is not in the practice, just in the practice management software where images Bingo. are outside or we're saving, we're backing up our 3d images somewhere else, or we're saving patient files with um, their insurance claims on our desktop or whatever. All of that you're saying is the, the, another big issue we should be considering. Absolutely. Keep in mind that we are protecting their health information. That's what hhs.gov wants us to do. But the biggest reason for um, hacking and for theft is just for identity theft, social security numbers and date of birth. Right. Uh, so there's there's two different things conflicting here that get in our way. But we have to protect to the level that says that if it inadvertently is leaves the office, it must be protected at a level that says if somebody intercepts it, theft, loss, whatever, that it is protected so that it can't be breached. That's the key, and a good assessment will show you where your vulnerabilities are. But to your point, and a little later on, we're going to go through an example that actually got us started in data security where one of our customers back in 2015 got robbed. And we'll go through exactly the steps that this person has had to go through. So the most common breaches, uh, as of June of 2018, excuse me, I haven't updated this lately, in all of healthcare, this is what has brought about the breach notifications. 47% were hacking or an IT incident, 35% unauthorized, 13% theft of computer, 10% improper disposal of loss. That's throughout all of healthcare, including um, companies that have human resource records, employee records that have nothing to do with manufacturing healthcare, but they are protecting health data. Um, Ernst & Young, the accounting firm, one of their major parts of what they do is help companies that have nothing to do with healthcare, but can contain records that are healthcare or that are health records. They have to protect it through the HIPAA laws as well. But it's interesting when we look at just dental offices breaches. Now, there's only been 25 major breaches reported as of June of 2018. It is increasing greatly. There's a lot of misnomers as to what should be reported and what shouldn't. I'll make no comment on that right now, but let's look at the facts. 48% are due to theft or loss of a computer, hardware device, or other portable device. By far, the loss or theft of an item containing it that's not properly encrypted is the number one reason for reports. 24% paper, only 16% hacking. The fear that we get and the, the, the pushback we get is that no one's going to target my office. No hacker is going to target. That's what I'm concerned about. You're right. No hacker is going to sit there and spend the time and energy. And they are very, very um, advanced. And it takes a specific skill set. And the prize has to be very large. Where it's very damning for a dental office to get hacked, it's not a big enough prize for a professional hacker. They're gonna go after, <laughs> the joke is, the target was target. Target chain, when that got hit, was a huge cache of information. Um, the IRS got hit. You know, These are millions of datas, not 5,000. So hacking isn't really the issue at all here, and neither is unauthorized access or disclosure by mistake. The biggest is theft and loss of a device. So we have to protect against it. Again, that has nothing to do with privacy and paperwork and everything to do with security of your data on your network. So this is how much has been fined since uh, it started as of August of 2017. $72 million, 52 cases in the dollar amount. Uh, They were all investigated, different entitlements, national pharmacies, hospital chains, smaller providers but really nothing in dental. Now, no substantial fines, nothing really significant in dental offices yet. However, from InsideHHS.gov, they have started to do audits of small, meaning single and dual practitioner for healthcare, be it dental or medical. And precedents have already been set 
in medical cases. The PHI, protected health information in dental, is absolutely no different than medical. We all understand this, and we need to realize that they are subs they can be set up to the same levels of fines for medical and dental. And this is the actual cheat sheet that HHS.gov uses for each violation and what can happen. If the violations occurred before the High Tech Act or after, it varies. And this is $100 to $50,000 per patient. And we haven't seen them, but they can happen. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but this is the government rules you're looking at right here. This isn't something made up. This is provided through the Information Act. That This is what HHS uses as guidelines. So reasonable cause, which means you should have been able to figure out what was wrong. Willful neglect. You knew you had a problem. You didn't correct it. Um, and willful neglect, and you, you just ignored people letting you know. But this has not hit us yet, so I don't want to fear anybody to worry that HHS.gov is going to run into your office here at noon and hold you up for large fines. They're not going to do that. But the precedence has been set. These are the fines. But let's now, look at a however, little bit of an inch. Go ahead. To go, to go back, though, again, and I and I agree. I appreciate that you're not you're not saying, oh my gosh, you guys got to do this because of the fines, because that's not the reality of it at this point. However. No, the idea, and, the, and like we said, the, the real case that I'm now familiar with, I mean, the downtime, the uh, concern of privacy, the how are we going to run, um, you know, uh, the, the stress level, um, the concern of patient information, I mean, all of that right now is real when it comes to dental and, and what you should be considering um, concerns that you have, correct? I mean, you, you deal with oh, dental. Absolutely. Well get that phone call Monday morning where it's like, I just walked in on my server. I can't get anything working. Well, and, and the, the, we're going to go over the case right now that, that started us on this. But the yeah. reality is very simple. If your security system or the health of your network that allows you to prevent downtime, either because of a malicious ransomware attack or because of a server failure, if you have it assessed properly, what happens is, is the chances of downtime due to a server failure or malicious software attack or theft all are decreased because, Lori, you're absolutely correct. I know the person you're talking about. Uh, all of the data was secure. All the data was fine. But it was such a nasty attack that they were down for four days. Well, right. I'm sorry, that's absolutely not completely true. But the IT part of it was going on for six days. The IT part of it, billable hours by the IT person to correct the problem, even though the data was totally safe, totally protected, um, doesn't constitute a breach by anybody's definition. I'm not an attorney, right. but I do work with one. So just the aggravation of it, and it was preventable. Right. And, and we can talk about how it ransomware, just so everybody's clear, what does that mean? Okay. This again, I, I can't stress this enough. When this started in the fourth quarter of 2014, it was nothing. But it started when you could get digital currency, Bitcoin. So you could demand payment for a service, or in this case, ransom, that is not traceable. Once it became non-traceable, it, the, the crooks can sit wherever they want and say, pay me. Now, what happens in dental? Let's talk specifically dental. Nobody is saying, I want to target um, Laura Hatch's dentist. No one's saying that. Not big enough prize. But they have ways to uh, fish, which is P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, where they just do these automatically, electronically, and until they hook somebody. The most common way is through an incoming email that is disguised, camouflaged, whatever you want to say, as a company or an individual that you trust. Um, one of the most common ones we're seeing now is Bank of America. Another one is um, Amazon Prime. Um, well, originally it started UPS and FedEx. 
Uh, a very common one that we saw in dental was uh, from us, from an actual patient. The name on the, the email said the patient's name, although it really wasn't from them. And it said, I understand you're looking at hiring a new individual. Here's a resume I thought you might be interested in. So if in when you used to be a front office manager, Laura, and if I was a patient, if you got an email from me, you said, oh, Steve sent me a resume. He knows we're looking for a new hygienist. That's awful nice. The minute you click on that resume, you have launched ransomware into your system and it's already too late. You can't be stopped. And then the damage starts. It first off investigates and learns where in your server are the most important files that they can prevent you from getting access to so that you're motivated to pay the ransom. And then they start encrypting it, literally locking it in place so you can't get to it. And then something comes up on your screen saying, congratulations, you're now a victim of and joined the family of, and they've got some very cheeky front screens that they put up there that says you have X number of hours to pay X number of Bitcoin, or we will lock you out of your data forever. And it's usually something that is, you would consider affordable. You started out that it was $300, then the average went up to 900. Now we're seeing them at low end, about $1,400. Very commonly now they are $3,000. But it looks like that would be an easy way to get out of it. But as example by the one we just worked on for this person that Laura also knows, you pay it once. There's four more levels of encryption that were underneath it that the crooks kept saying, well, now you got to pay me a second one. Now you got to pay me a third one. And there's nothing saying, and it happens better than half the time, that when you actually pay a ransom, they leave behind other damaging software that can go after everything from banking records to social security numbers to date of birth and all of that. It is very, very damning. And you need to avoid it because it will take you down for four to six days. You're going to pay money. You're going to probably pay more than once. And you're not even sure you're going to get your, your data back every time. Well, because thank you for explaining. Number of it. Until recently, yeah. I thought that just happened in the movies. <laughs> I mean, I didn't realize that it was a real thing. And so that, I'm, I'm glad that you explained that because this really can happen to any, anybody listening to it. So, okay, I'll let well, you keep it, going. I got I to stress this. This is the single largest thing that's taking down our customers right now. Now, granted, we're recovering them and they're fine, but it's the single largest IT issue that we're running into today. It is not uncommon to have three or four of our customers a day being hit with this. Wow. This is, and it's growing at 23,000 new pieces of ransomware are being launched every single day, each one advanced and how it camouflages itself. Pay attention to this. This is, <laughs> this is going to get all of us. So I can't yeah. stress that enough. So let's look at, let's say it's not ransomware. Let's say it's a theft. This is what happens. This is what got us going. First Saturday of 2015, breach. Our, our sponsorship, or excuse me, our service detected it, not the breach, but it detected that there was a problem, that the server was not responding. Um, this was on a Saturday, but we do this 24-7, notified the customer, let them know, and then did what's called failing over. So we took over and ran the network. So everything's up and running. No patients were lost. Everybody, the schedule was fine, except they had had a theft. They broke in, went right to the server, which was in the basement, took it, and ran out. They were in and out, police said, in under two minutes. So they had to go through the HIPAA breach notification. Everything they needed to do, notified HIPAA of the breach. They hired a HIPAA consultant to help them. They notified all the patients of record, offered identity protection, which is virtually mandatory. It isn't, but you're foolish if you don't. Some pushback started. They hired a HIPAA attorney and notified all legal local media outlets. From January 3rd to May 31st, their bottom line cost, no fines, no nothing, no suits from customers, excuse me, patients, went over $100,000. The estimation loss of patients is 20 to 25%. This is a woman uh, in Northern California that did make it through it. 
but it's very good that she was 20 years into her practice. She had paid down things so that she had a very profitable situation, but regrettably, she was getting ready to think about retiring. The value of her practice dropped significantly. So you can figure, even with a million dollar practice, I'm not saying that's what she did, but that's, you're taking $100,000 off the bottom line in four or five months. That's a heck of a hit, plus take 20% of your top line patients and make them go away. So you're getting hit at the top line and the bottom line. This is the real impact of a breach. You want to avoid a major data breach um, (laughs) and ransomware attacks as much as possible. And that all stems from security. So now that we've scared you, (laughs) what are you going to do? This is not difficult but you do have to take steps. Don't put your head in the sand like most of the people we've run into. It's not going to work. All it's going to do is invite a real problem, either a ransomware attack or a breach or both. So ransomware attack can end up with a data breach, a major data breach. You don't want that. So first thing you have to do is appoint a security officer. Typically, it's, it's you guys, the office manager or the owner or both. Schedule the HIPAA risk assessment. It sounds like I'm trying to sell you something. I am telling you your distributor will sponsor this. And just for working with Laura, if you don't have a distributor that will sponsor this, but I'm sure you do because we deal with national ones, this will cost you nothing. Zero. No obligation, no charge. It's usually $995. But through this with Laura and your distributors, we will do this no charge. You need to know this information. Then the smart thing to do is get a HIPAA product. I'm going to tell you, of course, do it through us. It'd be $900 a year, way below the average. But more importantly, we will do this every single quarter. Hire a good local provider. Make sure they know about password management and domains. Now, don't be scared about this, but that's how you set up a network. Either do it domains or work groups. Uh, domain is more secure. We can explain that more in detail later. Don't worry about it. But you need to know that you have secure and good firewalls, uh, that you've done the proper protection of your computers. Had the office in 2015 had their servers encrypted or physically locked as suggested by HIPAA, they would never have had that breach and never lost that $100,000 and 20% of their patients. There's ways to protect against it that are not illogical and not costly, and you need to learn them. Then you need to make sure your emails are encrypted. It's an easy thing now. There's a number of different services that do them. And you got to have a backup management. You got to have a recovery plan. It is part of HIPAA, and you got to understand what is your recovery plan, either from a natural disaster or, more importantly, more realistically, uh, ransomware attack or a theft. What is your plan and what should your expectations be? We can help you through that. Now, here's what we would do for you. This is a blatant advertisement, but as you look at things, you need to understand what to expect from somebody who's going to help you with your HIPAA. We'll create the documentations, all your policies and procedures, staff training, patient-facing forms, all of it, and the quarterly risk assessment. And we will do this organizationally through a portal that's specific to you yourself with all of your training, everything on it. And we'll manage the HIPAA training yearly. And very importantly, we will help you avoid a costly breach and we're backed by the strongest HIPAA attorneys and experts in the industry. Now, I cannot stress this following enough. We get very fortunate. When my partner and I decided we were going to try to get into this, we had already sat down and gone through all of the ADA, at the ADA, every single one of the HIPAA lectures and found large discussions about some things that we knew really weren't right. They weren't true. They weren't accurate. So we figured we needed to have a good legal backup. A friend of a friend sent me to Ernst & Young. Didn't know why I was going to an accounting firm, but learned quickly that they deal with HIPAA, as I mentioned earlier. They searched their employees and assigned to us, and is on retainer, an attorney 
who is an active member of the board, the bar, excuse me, that worked for the Office of Civil Rights, formatted all of the HIPAA laws, helped write a majority of them, and didn't even do the ADA manual. This woman is a HIPAA expert. She is on retainer to us, and she has helped us format and did all of the writing of the trainings, the policies, procedures, the business associate agreements, did the study of every single state law and how it varies from the HIPAA, the HIPAA federal laws, and what you should know about them, where it varies and why it's important to know it. In addition, anybody that's a customer, and this is a blatant advertisement, but you got to understand, you need this. If you had a question, if you had a thought, you had a breach, and you did your your internal audit that you're supposed to do, your incident audit, and you still had questions, you get an hour's legal consultation with this woman every single year as part of it. You need to have the legal backup so you don't guess. This is no time to guess when you're talking about breaches that a notification will cost over $100,000. And I'm serious when I tell you the fact, and Laura probably knows this as well, there's not a single reported breach in dental that's not cost the office at least $100,000 to correct the problem without fines, without legal suits from a patient, at least $100,000, and it always happens in the first six months. That is the minimum we have seen on anybody. And that's awfully expensive when you're talking about private practices. So I want to ask if there's any questions on that before we get um, to the part only, of saying thank you. <laughs> there we go. I, I think this was amazing. Um, I, if anybody knows Front Office Rocks and me, I'm all about customer service and answering phones and handling patients. And when it comes to privacy and HIPAA and OSHA and insurance, it's not my favorite thing. But see, I mean, you've taught me so much today. So I greatly appreciate it. Um, if there's any questions from anybody listening, we have a minute or two. Um, please, you know, go ahead and send them. I guess my question would just be, um, you do then recommend working with a good IT company and then also getting this assessment. Um, and I love that you say it's a blatant advertisement for you guys. I wouldn't have you on here if I didn't totally trust you. So I'm glad that you're being clear about it, but I would love for everybody to work with you. Um, but is it matter that the IT company is local or I know there's a lot of companies who are all over the country and can remote in. What's your thoughts on how to know you're working with a good, um, reputable IT company? Are there any things that they should consider? Well, as a matter of fact, we get a lot of questions about that. There's two, two thoughts that I want to bring up here. One, when you look at recovery or backup and, and HIPAA versus your IT provider, especially when you're talking about recovery and the people who are in charge of controlling your data and making sure it's secure and safe. Trying to keep that with two different companies is wisdom, just like it's not always good to keep your accounts payable and your accounts receivable person as the same person. It's always good to have a checks and balance. Don't give the keys to the kingdom to one person as far as protecting your data and being able to lock you out of your data if they're upset with you. That's something we have run into recently, and we run into it frequently. I don't want to give you the information on how to get into your server. Well, I'm sorry, but the IT provider is paid by the owner of the server. The IT provider should not be able to dictate who can get into the server and who can't. That, to me, is dangerous. Right. Um, secondly... IT is absolutely mandatory. There is so much that they do to help your day. But being able to choose one, especially when things are changing the way they are. Four years ago, you didn't need to have an IT provider that needs to do what they need to be able to do now. The growth of data and the protection of the data, the amount of the data is redundant, but it needs to be stressed. Laura, when you and I started working together, the average office had less than 50 gigabytes worth of data, and that's nationally. That's a hard number. It's actually, it was 45 to be specific. The amount now is more like 180 gigabytes on average. You can't work without access to your data. Right. Five years ago, you could get through the day. It was a difficult day, but you could get through the day. Yeah. You can't now. So you need somebody that's there, and they need to be up to date with technology and domains and firewalls. So having 
tried to do this verbally and didn't work. What we have done is we've developed a, a PowerPoint presentation on what you actually should be looking for in an IT provider in today's environment and how to ask them the right questions so that you know that you're going to get the right person. We provide that to our customers and we will help judge a good IT provider. We're not going to interview them, but we will look at any proposals and make sure that they look right. That's part of the consulting that we do because the person who might have been good at doing and setting up a network five years ago from you might not be qualified to take care of what you need to take care of today. Sure. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, somebody had mentioned that they heard of a dental office that got fined for unencrypted emails. And I get asked all the time about how do we make sure that our emails are, are HIPAA compliant without necessarily going through a list of companies. Um, can you get fined for or have problems with unencrypted emails? And do you have any suggestions about that? Well, I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any on the wall. Uh, any of the fines, of course, they're usually major. Usually when you're talking about fines with unencrypted emails, it's one or two patients being sent to, you know, between different pay practices or whatever. It is real easy now to, to get encrypted email services. And you used to have to have a separate service. Uh, the ADA has a service. Uh, there's a company called Send Inc. that a lot of people use that we used to recommend. It was very easy. But right now, when you look at Google or Office 365, um, is it 360 or 365? Whichever, when you look, yeah. whichever, they are now to the point where they are providing encrypted emails. You need to make sure that you purchase at the level that covers that. It's usually we would call the business account level. We use Gmail at our office. We use the business level of it. And our emails are encrypted. So it's now becoming so commonplace because of these problems that your generic services like your Gmail and like your um, Outlook and Windows and whatever are getting to the point where they can start to do that. You need to look at that. But yes, you need to make sure. And one of the par important parts is not just when you transmit from office to office. You need to make sure it's encrypted as it sits at rest because there's a treasure trove of information in your emails that are resting in your office. Proper um, by Gmail business that we use, those are all encrypted. They can't be hacked. So you've done the right job of protecting it. But I don't personally know of any office that's been fined yet. They may have been, okay. but they certainly haven't hit the, they haven't hit the wall of shame that we've seen. <laughs> well, that's good for them. So final question. And then, um, like we said here, Steve and I are both available. Of course, this, what our topic was today is way over my head. Um, but with, that's why I brought Steve on to help everybody. So his contact information is there. And Steve, I'm sure you'd be more than willing to talk to anybody who has questions or I appreciate the offer you're giving all the clients about getting the free assessment. Um, is there yeah, any HIPAA, I, HIPAA insurance? I, I want to Oh, go ahead. There is there is HIPAA insurance, and yeah. and it's not necessarily a bad thing. It will there's two things that will help you with. It'll help you with deferring the cost, legal costs, of of dealing with a breach. Be very careful of the following. A number of the companies will look at this and say, yes, you have insurance. However, you want to make sure that it doesn't say as a part of the policy that you must use their attorney and you must use their accountant. I wouldn't want to go from my accountant and the company to somebody else or some other attorney other than the one I'm used to. So they would dictate, you know, who's, who's your, who's your legal protection and who's your accountant. Be careful with that. Now that will help with defray the costs and there will be minimums, maximums on this. But I don't know, and I don't think it covers the actual federal fines. It will cover the cost of notification and of attorneys and accountants. But again, you may have to live with their attorneys and accountants if you get their insurance. So it doesn't hurt. But right. frankly, a good assessment will, <laughs> you, can't, you can't avoid the fact you need an assessment. Yep. You can't avoid the fact that a proper assessment will help you out tremendously. And frankly, it's no charge, no obligation. 
it's the best and easiest step to take. Yep. So on that note, Steve, I want to thank you for joining us today. I recommend anybody and everybody listening to this to please get an assessment. Um, don't wait until this happens to you in your practice. I have a feeling we're going to hear more and more of it over the next few years. So I just hope that everybody follows the right steps. Steve, thank you. Any final thoughts before we end today? I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And uh, as I say, uh, action is needed and there's an easy way to do it. Take the steps now before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Have a great day, everybody. If you have any questions or want to follow up with Steve, his information is there. And if you need any front office training, front office rocks is always here for you. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.